sure that I take time to get myself focused. And sometimes that works great. Sometimes it doesn't. You know what? At the end of the day, that's God. We just we always leave room and let God do what God's going to do. Amen. Um, one of the first things I want to make sure that I do. I see some visitors this morning, and I want to welcome you. It's good to see you. If you would look on your bulletin. If you're visiting, look on the back of your bulletin. You'll see a place there for visitors. If you would fill that information out for me and uh, put that in the offering plate here in just a couple minutes so that we can follow up with you, we'd appreciate that. Also, uh, in the same space, you'll see uh, an area for prayer requests. So if you have a prayer need or a concern that you'd like to have our staff or a prayer team pray over, please fill that out as well and put that in the offering plate here in just a couple of minutes. We'd appreciate that. Um, I'll take this opportunity to remind all of you, you can find the bulletin on the Bible app and, and, and look at it there. You can also go to our webpage and post your prayer concerns on the prayer wall on the webpage. And all of that information is in the bulletin as well. Taking a quick look at uh, a couple of announcements that we have in the bulletin. Uh, I always encourage you to read over those. I'm not going to go through them in detail. But look through your bulletin. Look at the prayer concerns. Um, the folks who are uh, currently listed there and in need. Uh, look at the ones who are in uh, maybe in between being shut in and having some more serious needs where they can't get out. As well as those that are in facilities. Pray for them. But I encourage you each week, don't just pray for them. Um, if you're compelled, please reach out and contact them. Send them a card, give them a phone call. If you can, go visit them. I know how much they would appreciate that. Um, take a look then at the birthdays and celebration. And maybe most importantly on the back, uh, you'll see the calendar for meetings this week. I think that's very important. I want to uh, introduce this morning, I'm going to put Austin and Angie on the spot. And have them come up front for just a second. Um, I asked Austin to speak, uh, Angie, but he said you would do that. Was that okay? No, it's not okay. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything. I'll just meet you here. But I want to introduce to you Austin and Angie Young. Austin is our new uh, pastor of student ministries. And his wife, Angie Gavin, who I know that you're most concerned and interested in meeting, is in the nursery. So if I see any of you sneak out, I'll know where you're but uh, we just want to welcome you guys to our church. We're so excited to have Austin was working this week. It was great to have him here and get started. And uh, he's a go-getter. He's already pushing me, so that's fantastic. All right. Thanks. All right, guys. Have a seat. Great to have you here. And they brought a few visitors with them, too. Isn't that good? You know? So we're glad to see them as well, I think. Mom and Grandma are here, and uh, hopefully that continues. Okay, at this time, any other announcements? Anything that I do want to make sure? I sent a letter out uh, on Friday uh, about Penny's Penny McGowan service, and hopefully everybody got it. Um, things things kind of went so quickly with their plans that they weren't going to be able to get that information in the paper where you guys would see it. It is on the Lambert Tapman website. But just so you know, the service will be tomorrow here in the church. Visitation starts at 11 and the service is at 1 o'clock. Okay, so I just want to make sure that you knew that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each and every opportunity, Lord, that we have to be together as a body of Christ, as a church family, Lord, in fellowship and in communion and in particular to worship you and to praise you. So we pray right now that uh, this time would be used for your purpose and for your glory as you work on us. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds to you. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. to do congregational singing if you guys will all stand. Everybody sing out. You want to hear every voice. Our first hymn is I uh, decided to follow Jesus.
Dale and I in our pre-service worship team meeting, we were looking at the hymn selection, and you guys sounded great. Our, our goal every week is obviously, first and foremost, we want to pick hymns to, to create an environment for worship. We want God to, to be released, you know, and let that spirit out. Um, but we also try to select songs that we think you, everybody knows in order to facilitate that. And we were looking at the list, and today we added quite a bit of activity. We're following, we're leaning, we're standing, and we're turning. So everybody should be, you know, really loose and limber by the end of the service today, which is fantastic. And uh, I think a few weeks ago in our sermons on the uh, churches in Revelation, you know, uh, that standing on the uh, promises versus sitting on the premises, that's always a good thing. So, we are off to a fantastic start this morning. Transitioning uh, to an attitude of prayer. Um, I, I, I say every week, you know, there are so many needs. We've had a very um, busy and full week of various needs. And uh, those are just the ones we know about, right? And, and all of the other needs or concerns that that you are dealing with, that you are praying for. Um, I, I just want to take a moment and thank our deaconesses and, and our deacons, our deacons who pray for these needs and our deaconesses who serve. Um, I love my church family, and, and pride goes before destruction, but I'm proud of the service that you guys provide to our church family when they're in need, and I want to say thank you. It's been a busy week. It will be a, another busy week. So thank you in advance. I want to share with you a quote from E. Stanley Jones. If you can follow along, he says, prayer, prayer is surrender. We talked about that, that we need to submit, we need to humble ourselves before God. Prayer is surrender, surrender to the will of God and cooperation with that will, with God's will. He's saying in his quote, if I throw out a boat hook, so if I throw a boat hook from the boat and I catch hold of the shore and I pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? You see, prayer is not about pulling God to my will, but aligning my will with the will of God. That, that's prayer. That's prayer. It, not to oversimplify, but it's that simple. In the midst of everything else that, that we, we need to pray for in intercession, in intercession, we need to pray first and foremost for God's will and then be thankful. We need to humble ourselves. You know, sometimes the challenges that we're facing are so difficult that we don't even really know for sure what to ask or how to ask. And as I go through these weeks, and sometimes week after week, I'm learning that these moments are, are when we most clearly understand that we should always and most simply just be praying for His will. Sometimes we just need to be still and know that He is God. Now, he does tell us to ask, you know, that we need to ask that we haven't received because we haven't asked, but we need to seek His will first and give thanks. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 and 18. I'll end prayer with this, this, this call to rejoice always. Think about all the concerns that were on your mind and heart as I was talking through the various needs. What was on your mind? What was on your heart? It probably wasn't rejoicing. But here the Bible's telling us, rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Why? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we ask you to help us be still. To help us know that you are God. To help us just listen. 
Lord, we ask that your spirit would speak words of wisdom, words of guidance over us today and every day, Lord, as we seek you. You promised a comforter, Lord, who would be with us every step of the way to guide us, to give us what we need. So, Lord, be with us. You are our, our light, Lord. We're the lampstands. We need to shine in the darkness. When we don't know which way to turn, we know we can run to your light. Lord, shine that light. Use us to shine it in dark places. Guide our feet, Lord, in the path of peace and comfort. When we're facing fear and we're facing discouragement, Lord, be that sunrise. Bring us the security and the knowledge and the peace and comfort that keeps us in your perfect will. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'll ask our ushers to come forward and receive this morning's offer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing this morning on our tithes and offerings. Lord, we give back to you as you have blessed us, and we pray for your blessing on our faithfulness and our cheerfulness in giving, Lord, that, that you would make us good and faithful stewards of all of your creation, of the gifts you've given us, and would always guide us, Lord, as we seek to use our time and our talent and our treasures according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, uh, we're blessed our choir is going to do our uh, special music this morning. Thank you.
Becky, thank you. As the choir is uh, being seated, I'll take this opportunity. If you were in kindergarten through uh, fifth grade, uh, you can be dismissed to go to Children's Church at this time. And also, I hesitate to... Um, sorry. To bring it up. It's such a beautiful song, and it is perfectly, perfectly, perfectly uh, in line with uh, the message this morning. But I was told uh, just a moment ago that, sorry, that there is a, a luncheon after church. I have an older version of the bulletin, so somebody corrected me. I was supposed to make an announcement that you were all invited to a pastor appreciation luncheon right after church. So I feel kind of self-serving even mentioning it, but... Um, I'm delighted to hear that. I wasn't aware of that until a few moments ago. So uh, the deacons and deaconesses are preparing that right now. And immediately following the service, um, I invite you to join us for that. So I apologize that I overlooked that. But in terms this morning of counting the cost, and, and yet, as the choir just performed for us, the answer is simply... What is the cost of following Jesus? The answer is everything. Everything. So if you guys want to head to lunch, we can leave now. <laughs> no, that wouldn't be any fun at all. Um, you know, I want to try to frame it this way. We talk a lot about fellowship, as we should. It's very important. But I want to talk about I want to take that word and change it today. Instead of fellowship, I want to talk about followship. Okay? Followship. I want to talk about, we've, we've been on this journey through the churches of Revelation and what we can learn and what we can take from that personally, what we can take from that as a church family. Um, but it's all about getting to work. It's all about getting back to being and acting and doing you know, the good works that Christ intended us to do. You know, last week we talked about grabbing the shovel again and, and getting to work. What's it mean to follow Christ? What's it mean to say yes and to grab your shovel? What does it cost? And why should we count the cost? That's what we're going to talk about today. There was a, document, uh, a documentary uh, from an early 20th century exposition to the South Pole. Uh, the documentary, the quote comes from Ernest Shackleton, that's who made the expedition. Before he made the journey, he put a newspaper ad in the London newspaper, and it read this, it read this way, Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. Sincerely, Ernest Shackleton. Wow, what a job description. Interestingly, though, men responded to his advertisement in droves. Why? There's nothing about that job that sounds appealing. They responded in droves primarily because the mission was clear. The cost and the potential loss was clear and it drew the right men to the job. It made sure that the wrong men didn't sign up. God's mission similarly, it, certainly not for the faint of heart, even becoming a Christian, right? Be becoming a Christian, according to Jesus, should be weighed heavily. This morning, the scripture, as we focus on fellowship and the cost of following Christ, is from Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, and I'm going to start uh, with verse 26. 
I'm going to share that with you now, and then we'll look at the rest of this pericope as we go through the sermon. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, or look in your app. Luke 14, 26 reads, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you bless the reading of your word and bless the ears and the hearts, Lord, that need to hear it. Now I pray that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. The Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So before we dive into this, I want to make something really, really clear. I want to just be sure that we, we all understand that in these verses, before, uh, before chapter uh, 14 and, and then after, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Okay, he's, uh, we, we need to just make sure, and, and before I do that, I'll share something that I've talked about before, right? We, we hear these terms in the Bible and the New Testament all the time. Let's make sure that we're, we're using and understanding the right terms. Multitudes, right? We hear multitudes. Those were the big crowds of people that were following Christ, right? They were interested in what they had heard about him, and, and they were following him around to hear what he had to say. Those were the multitudes. What we refer to as disciples, right, are his students. It, it literally translates into students, and apostles, we think of those 12, right, that were selected especially for Christ's purpose. Apostle translates to messenger. Okay? And here's where it gets confusing for us sometimes. In the New Testament, and Christ even did this, and we do this still today, we interchange the word disciple and apostle all the time. And we need, we need to sometimes step back and remind ourselves, right, that sometimes Jesus is talking about disciples. He's talking about all of his students that we know number much, much greater than 12. Okay? They're, so just when you hear that, today he's talking to the Pharisees and he's talking about disciples and he's talking about what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. Disciples are students. Apostles are also disciples, right? They're students of Christ. But disciples are not necessarily apostles. Are you with me? Okay. That's important. I, just, I want to make sure that's clear because it can get confusing as we go through today's message. So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's in the house of what Luke refers to as one of the rulers of the Pharisees. That would mean he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin, okay, which was the Jewish ruling council. So they were there to eat bread. It was the Sabbath. And in typical fashion, right, the Pharisees aren't as interested in Jesus as they are maybe catching him in a mistake. right? They want to, they want to see him trip up, uh, do something wrong, say something wrong. Um, one of the well, Jesus, you know, it, it, before we get to today's verses, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. Well, that got their attention, right? But then he proceeds to teach them through various parables, you know, before and after today's verses. And one of the general themes across all of these parables that he's giving, that he's sharing with the Pharisees, is he's highlighting their struggles their failures, if you will, in priorities, right? The Pharisees' self-righteousness, their focus in putting themselves above the law, putting themselves above the people that uh, the law was intended for, putting themselves in a higher place than maybe even the God they worshipped, you know, the people that they were supposed to reach and serve and teach with the law. Their priorities were out of whack. And, and again, it's a broad stroke. In a general sense, you can take that away from his message through all these different parables. But in the middle of these parables, he talks to them directly. 
he stops talking in, in messages and stories, right? In parables. And he, and he says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Pretty direct. Any questions? What does it cost to follow Jesus? Everything. Everything. It's worth noting in my, in my study Bible a couple of comments I want to share with you. In that first sentence, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father or mother, it seems like an odd word. Something important to understand, in the ancient uh, Near Eastern uh, their concept of hate is different than how we use the word hate today. Okay, It's very important in context to understand that. Their concept of hate didn't have to do with these intense feelings or revulsion of something or towards someone. Not the way we use it. To hate something in their culture meant to place it in a lower position. To give it the lowest priority. Um, it was beneath everything else. Okay? So we're talking about prioritization. Not that loathing sense that we use in any. Jesus, therefore, was not telling his followers to loathe their families, but rather to ensure that God was the highest priority in their lives. The highest priority. God first. Right? We already know this about God, right? We, if we go to Exodus and we look at the commandments that God gave, gave us, you shall have no other gods before me, right? He goes on, he says, you shall not make yourself a carved image in any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I... The Lord, your God, am a jealous God. So he made it clear then, and Christ is making it clear at this time, that He is to be our number one priority. It's about priorities. Nothing should be more important than your relationship, than your discipleship, than your work for Jesus. For Jesus and for His glory. Nothing should be more important. And I'd go a step further, even in the sense that we think about priorities clearly as number one, number two, number three. I would challenge and say, let's go a step further than that. It's not just about Him being the top priority. It's about Him being the reason and the focus and the purpose of every priority. That's how you put it first. You make Him the first in everything. If you can do that, then it's not as important what order they're in. We know then that everything we're doing is for God. And He's first in everything. That's the sense that Jesus is trying to portray to the Pharisees. About what it costs to follow Him. I'll give you another example. Another good illustration. Right? When... It costs everything to follow Christ, to become one with Christ in spirit. Think about the model for a second that God gives us for marriage. It's perfect. It's intentional. It's God's design. Picture this in Genesis 24, or sorry, 2 verse 24. It says... Therefore, a man shall leave his father and a mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And in Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6, Jesus says this, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them 
male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. The church is often referred to as the bride of Christ, right? We see that imagery over and over and over in the New Testament. And in the exact same way as in God's perfect definition of marriage, we, His church, must also leave everything, leave everyone else, and join together with Christ. In becoming one with Him. So what does it cost to follow Jesus? Everything. Second part of this is, what does it mean to count the cost? Now we understand the cost. Why would we count the cost? Counting the cost means that we need to take the time to intentionally and purposefully understand what is required before we make a decision. And we need to make plans. Why? Why? So that we can do the work. So that we can do what's required of us. And more importantly, so we can finish what is required of us. Jesus explains it this way in the following verses. When we look at verses uh, 28 and, uh, through 30. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. There's an air of witness in there as well. We need to understand the cost. We need to understand what's required so we can do the work and we can finish it. We need to also understand that doing and finishing glorifies God. And our inability to understand and plan and account for that cost and do the work and finish the work is a witness, hopefully for His glory. But if we don't, it's still a witness. <coughs> he goes on in verse 31 with a, with a different example at the same point. He says, Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able to with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Again, let's go back and remember, family took the highest priority in their culture. It was more important than anything else. So the idea that God should be the center of one's life, that was kind of radical. It required a serious consideration, accounting of the cost, up front, in advance, understand and count the cost. And I read it already, I'll read it again in the last verse of this uh, section. He says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. The word here, which is translated as forsake, means to give up, to renounce, to abandon your right of ownership. It, it doesn't imply selling everything that you own and selling all of your possessions or possessions and giving everything away. Instead, what it means is it's to become a good and faithful steward. Good and faithful steward, one who uses everything, everything that he has, all of his resources. 
for the service, right? And for the glory of Jesus Christ. Counting the cost then means understanding what is required and planning accordingly. To be a disciple of Christ, right? Weigh it out, consider it, understand it, so that you can do what is required and you can finish His work. This tied, in my mind, as I was studying and preparing, it tied so perfectly uh, with what we discussed last week when we were talking about grabbing our shells. Again, throw that out. To quit digging in and, and start digging out to get to work in faith and do the good works that Jesus wants you to do for Him and for His glory. In last week's message, I shared quickly with you the title of a book called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. It's about evangelism. You have to start. You have to follow Christ before you can be one. You have to be one before you can be one. Right? We've got to get started. Out of the salt shaker into the world. To illustrate this point that we're talking about, that we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. If we're, if we're going to be the salt of the earth, we have to get out of the salt shaker. It's that simple. We have to get to work in the world. So as we're looking this morning and studying the cost of following Christ... Jesus himself tells us the cost is everything. Jesus tells us the reason for counting the cost is to be his disciples. To become, to be sanctified, to do. And then at the end of the chapter in Luke, right after this section, the very next thing he says to the Pharisees is this. Verse 34. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You can't season salt. Salt is the seasoning. It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. And here's this phrase again. He who has ears to hear... Let him hear. Disciples, right? Students. We're not talking about the apostles. He's talking about students, followers of Jesus Christ. Disciples who don't exhibit the traits of their teacher. Disciples who don't exhibit the traits of Jesus aren't really disciples. They've lost their ability to season. They've lost their ability to preserve in the way that salt does. They've lost their ability to preserve what is wholesome and what is good. The message to the Pharisees is clear. Unsalty salt and ungodly disciples are equally useless. Jesus says basically the exact same thing in slightly, just so, ever so slightly different way in the, uh, the shadow of the Beatitudes. In Matthew 5, 13, he says it this way. Different audience, a different place. But he says the same thing in a different way. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Again, same message. Jesus speaking to disciples and the multitudes. The message is to all of us. Not just them, it's to all of us. Still today, this morning, right now. All of us who desire to follow Him. The numerous characteristics that salt has, right? The, the things that we use it for. 
It illustrates a, a Christian's role. What's required of us. It hinders the spread of corruption. It creates thirst. It enhances flavor. And Christians who live out the virtues that are described in those Beatitudes just before that verse, they achieve all of that. They're the salt of the earth. And as he described in Luke and here, those who don't, don't. So this morning the message is, be the salt of the earth. Get out of the salt shaker. Get to work. Hinder corruption. Create thirst. Enhance flavor. What does it cost to follow Jesus Christ? It costs everything. It costs us everything. But think about it. What's at stake? Think about what's at stake. Listen to what Jesus tells His own followers, His own disciples in the Gospel of Mark. Okay? And this is how I want to summarize this whole message. Mark 8, 34 and 36, He says... When He had called the people to Himself with His disciples also, He said to them, Whoever desires to come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for My sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? When we count the cost, when we consider the cost, it's not just about giving up the things that we tend to put above Him. It's not just about eliminating the one thing out of our life that we tend to make a higher priority. It's also about giving up the things that we need to give Him, that He begs us to give Him. Think about those things that, that we need to let go of. Fear, worry, anxiety, sin, and the shame of our sin. It's about letting go of all of that. This morning, what are you putting ahead of Him? What are you making a higher priority than Him? What are you holding on to? What are you holding on to this morning that you need to let go of? Give it to Him. Whatever it is, give it to Him. Friday on my way into the office, I... I turned my radio, XM radio, to the message, which is the Christian channel. And you might all be shocked to know that is very rare for me to do. I love music. I love Christian music. But when I'm by myself in my car, that's not my preferred choice. But in that moment, I hit the button. And what are the odds that, you know, you catch a song right as it's beginning? And I think it's a new song from Mercy Me called Then Christ Came. I just want to read the tag and the chorus of this song. This is what I heard in this moment. I never thought that I would ever see the day when every single chain would break or hear the voice of heaven call my name. Then Christ came. Changing everything. He took my sin and shame away. Now every song I sing will be for Him. Ever since the moment He walked in, then Christ came. Those are awesome moments. God winks, right? God taps you on the shoulder and says, Hey, pay attention. I got something for you. Jesus came. He died for you. He died for me. 
He died for all of us. He gave everything for us. Put Him first in your life. Give yourself to Him. Give Him everything in return. A personal relationship with Jesus is the key. It's the key to true joy and happiness. A relationship with Jesus Christ that permeates every other thing you do and becomes the reason why you do it. That's the key to true joy and happiness. So God, this morning, help us get our priorities in line. If we haven't already done so, help us count the cost and make a decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Only then you know, can we have that hope and peace of eternal life with Him. Count the cost. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for this message and for Your Word. Lord, for this opportunity to worship You and praise You. But we know that there is a cost to following You. And we know without a doubt that that cost is absolutely everything that we are. That cost is denying ourselves in following You. Lord, this morning, help us count the cost. Help us consider what is required. Empower us. Compel us. Encourage us to be bold and courageous in following and doing good works, Lord, for You and for Your glory. Lord, this morning, we choose to put You first. We choose to make You the highest priority the center and the reason we do what we do. Lord, we acknowledge that without You, we can do nothing. Lord, with, without You, we are nothing. Lord, have Your way in our lives as we seek You first in all that we do right now, Lord, in this moment and in this season. Help us to focus only on You, Lord, in Your constant, your loving presence in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your grace and for the faith that helps us see. Lord, let us continue to place our hope and our faith and confidence only in you. Remind us, Lord, that there is no more remarkable example of hope in our lives, Lord, than you. You willingly coming into this world to give your life. Let us count that cost. And let go of everything else so that we might become one with you. Lord, if someone here is present this morning that needs to know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would move on them. Where they sit, if they're listening in, wherever they may be, Lord, let your spirit move on their heart. Let them say yes to a personal relationship with you and to salvation. Lord, if someone present just needs to recommit, to rededicate to a closer walk with you, Lord, I pray that you would move on their heart as well in this moment. That they would count the cost and follow you. Lord, maybe somebody is just looking for a church, a place to serve you, to grow, to fellowship, to make you their highest priority in everything they do. Lord, I pray that you would lead them here to new hope. That they would find you here. Lord, in any situation where you may have moved this morning, where it's your will. I pray that in their first act of obedience, Lord, they would share that decision with us. 
as a witness to what you've just done for them and what you will be doing in their lives. Lord, we praise you this morning and we thank you. And we do everything we do in your name and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for our hymn of dedication. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. focus on you. Lord, to make you the, the highest priority in everything that we do. Lord, as we leave this place, let us always be a reflection of that. Let us always be your light, a reflection of your light into the world. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.